So yesterday, on a whim, because it was just an absolutely gorgeous day here in the Tularosa Basin, uh, we, about after lunchtime, I told Shannon, hey, let's go to White Sands. And so we packed up the kids and we spent a couple hours out there. And of course, we did what you always do when you go to White Sands. We took the sleds, we took a, a cooler of some drinks, some snacks, and, and some lawn chairs. We just had a wonderful afternoon. Um, and we always go up to, to the highest dune we can find and, and try to take a family picture up there. And while I was up there, it was just a stunning view. Those of you who've done exactly what I described, you know what I'm talking about, right? But as I was up there looking at this stunning view, I thought to myself, man, I'm sure glad I don't have to wander here for 40 years, right? It's gorgeous when you can go with a cold drink and then come back home with a, with a fridge full of food and, and a roof over your head and air conditioning or, or a heater. It's quite another thing to imagine us being stuck out there in the middle of nowhere in a true, genuine desert, wandering for 40 whole years. Doesn't that sound exhausting? Not knowing if you're going to make it another day. Not knowing if you're going to have shelter tomorrow. Not knowing where the food is going to come from. Now, if you know your Old Testament stories, you know that, that, that God did provide bread and God did provide meat. But you should also know that God's people always doubted it, right? Even though God promised them that, that there would be food, Israelites, as you're wandering in the desert, God's people continued to doubt that. Yes, we have bread today, we have food today, but God, what if you don't step up to your promises tomorrow? I am just as guilty. It sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Living in this cycle of fear and wondering what tomorrow is going to bring, wondering if you're going to make it, wondering if you could scratch by another day. And we may not be wandering in the desert of Israelites, uh, the desert of the Middle East, you know, 3,000 years ago, but I would say our wandering through 2020 has been quite deserted, hasn't it? It's felt like that, at least emotionally and spiritually for me, I have, I have just scratched and crawled my way to what we're experiencing today. And we still have almost two whole months left. We've learned that a lot can happen in two months in 2020, can't it? Who knows what sort of desert we have before us. Let, let me break this down into, a, into an experience, a deserted experience that I think we can all relate to this year. And, and let's call this the great toilet paper desert of 2020. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Those aisles and aisles and aisles where, where all you saw was empty toilet paper shelves as far as your eye could see. The toilet paper desert of 2020. Th there's actually a great explanation for why this happened. And it's called the scarcity cycle. I think I have an image of what that cycle looks like. The first part of this cycle is we fear. And what happened was early to mid-March, we started hearing that there was, oh no, a toilet paper shortage. We may not have experienced it ourselves, but we heard it on the news or we heard it on the radio or a neighbor told us. And so what did we do? Well, we were afraid. We were afraid we would be without toilet paper. So what did we do? We ran to the stores and we consumed it. We consumed it like crazy. Before any of the restrictions went into place, before you saw that sign on that aisle saying, please take one, you, take, you took 20, right? We consumed it like crazy. And then the next time we went back to the grocery store, even though we knew we had 20 packages in our closets, we saw those empty shelves. And what did we do? We realized that we were lacking. Our stores were lacking. And even though I, I'm a, I've got a good two-month supply in my closet, I'm going to still buy that one thing that's on the shelf there. Because who knows, who knows when it's going to come back. So we started to fear again, didn't we? Fear leads to consumption. Consumption leads to lack. And lack leads to fear again. It's a perpetual cycle that we put on ourselves. To me, that's 2020 in a nutshell. We started fearing this or that. We started fearing lack of this or lack of that. We started fearing this person or that person. And so we did everything that we could to protect ourselves, to dig our heels in and to just scratch ourselves by. But the more that we did that, the more resources we realized we didn't have. 
I was lacking energy. I was lacking motivation. I was lacking food. I was lacking a job. I was lacking a house. I was lacking a political candidate I could support. I was lacking X, Y, and Z. And so what did we do? The fear just kept on going. And you know what I realized I started doing? I started just surviving. I noticed that a couple weeks ago, people would ask me, Kelly, how are you doing? And almost jokingly or tongue in cheek, I would just say, oh, I'm surviving. But what a terrible way to live, right? What a terrible way to live. And church, I'm here to tell you today, I don't want to survive anymore. I don't want to just survive anymore. I want to thrive, amen? I want to thrive. And here's the good news of the gospel. You're getting it just three minutes into my sermon, Okay. Followers of Jesus can thrive right here, right now, today. No matter what we think we might lack, no matter what we think we have to fear today or tomorrow, we don't have to just survive anymore. You can thrive by the power of Christ's blood on the cross and his glorious resurrection. So that's what we're going to discover how to do these next few weeks. We're, we're going to discover how the simple act of coming to the table the table here at communion, the tables at your own homes, the table at Plateau Espresso or the table at Si Yours. But by coming to the table and all that that represents, we can discover a life of radical gratitude. And I don't know about you, but I think that's what the world needs today. Faithful followers of Jesus who are radically grateful for all God's good things. The Israelites needed to learn the same lesson that I think we need to learn. They needed to discover that they don't just have to survive in the desert anymore, but they can thrive in the promised land. And here at the very end of the book of Deuteronomy or close to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is giving some instructions to his people. They are at the very end of their 40 year wandering in the desert. They are about to step from surviving into thriving. And God is giving some very clear, simple instructions on how to do just that. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to couch ourselves in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26, and we are going to stop surviving, and we're going to start thriving. Amen? The first thing that Moses says uh, at the very close to the end of this message to the Israelites in 26 verse 1, he says this. He says, when you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it. Now, one thing sticks out to me so clearly at the very, very front of this passage. Notice with me, does God say, okay, Israelites, if you do X, Y, and Z, then you can go into the land. Does God say, if you strive this much or if you work this hard, then I will give this to you? No, no. <laughs> God says nothing of the sort. He's very, very clear and upfront at the very beginning of this chapter. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. It's a done deal, church. This is a great gift from God to his good people, and they are to receive it. Nothing that they have done has earned this good gift. Nothing that they have worked for has earned this good gift. They didn't have to earn God's love and grace, and neither do you. And that is good news, amen? So this is a free gift from God. It's not something they have to earn, not something that they have to work for, not something another human being gave to them, but something only God can give them. In church, all good things, all good things in our life today are the exact same way. Everything that I listed off that I'm thankful for at the beginning of this worship service, everything that you're going to say you're thankful for on the cards, everything that I hope you're writing in the comment section on Facebook that you are thankful for, you didn't work for any of it. That's just the truth. And if that offends some of you, I, I don't apologize. <laughs> it's just true. It's the gospel truth. All good things come from God and God alone. Now, we have our part to play. God invites us into a disciplined, righteous, and holy life that opens up even more goodness of God to us. But even those things only come from God. Even those things are only in our life because of God's goodness. And speaking of that part that we have to play, the Israelites were asked to do the same thing. Yes, this is a free gift that God is giving, but look what it says at the very ha last half of that verse. And you possess it. And you settle in it. 
Church, God's good gifts are all around us, but half the problem with Christians, or probably most the problem with Christians, is we don't step into those good promises. We are, we're blinded to them. Our ears are plugged from hearing the good news of those promises all around us, and we are our own worst enemies. We, we look at the empty table, and we only see just that, an empty table. We, we have yet to be able to see the great promises that this empty table represents. So church, are you thankful for something? And if you're struggling right now to, to find the words and the phrases to say what you're thankful for, pray that God would open your eyes to the good things that are already in your life. Because here's the great good news for us today. We don't have to wait to cross into the promised land. If we follow Jesus Christ, if we pro profess him as our Lord and Savior with our mouths and with the actions of our hands and feet, we are already in the promised land. That is the truth of the gospel of Christ. There, there is no great Jordan River that we have yet to cross over. We've already done it by the power of Christ's resurrection. Paul says as much in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he says that so if anyone in Christ, if anyone in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. You're no longer wandering in the desert church, so let's stop acting like it. You're no longer wandering in the desert, so let's stop just scraping by. Let's not just, let's not just hold on with our fingernails anymore because you don't have to. You don't have to just survive. You can thrive. And it's by having our eyes open to all the good things that are all around us and stepping into it and possessing it for ourselves and discovering the truly radical gratitude that God longs for us to have. You see, surviving is when we act as if we have to earn God's goodness. Surviving is merely the act of, of, of living as if there's something we have to work for. But thriving is when we live and act as if God's goodness is already here. And all we have to do is step into it. That is what survive, uh, thriving looks like. And that's what God is calling each of us to do. But it's not just for us, church. It's not just for us. It's one of the great, if not the great sin that God's people have constantly made. The idea that all God's good things belong to us. When in reality, God tells us the same thing he told Israel in the book of Isaiah. When he says, I will give you, and that's a you plural right there. I will give you Israel. I will give you the church as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. See, God's good things aren't just for us. They aren't just for you. They aren't just for you. They aren't just for me. God's good things are for the world. And any good things that we receive as his people are so that the world might know of his love and grace. You see, the church doesn't look at an empty table and see just an empty table. The church looks at an empty table and sees the promises and the possibility that, that his people might come together and feed its community. The, the church looks at the table and sees the promises and the possibility that, that, a, that a ragtag group of sinners can come together and say, you know what, our community has been hit really, really hard this year. And, and we're going to feed our community like never before. We're going to stock our food pantry. It's going to be busting at the seams. Our food pantry workers aren't going to know what to do with all the food. Sorry, Nancy, but you're not going to know what to do with all the food. That's what God's people do when they thrive. They, they look at an empty table and they see an abundance of possibilities. They, they look at an empty table and they see, they see the possibility of, of a community that, that so desperately needs to be fed a warm meal on a weekly basis. And they come together and provide thousands, church, thousands of meals just since COVID started into go boxes every single Saturday that have gone out far and wide across this area. That's what it looks like for God's people to thrive. 
God's people thrive when they look at a, at a plain piece of cloth and sew literally thousands, tens of thousands of, of dresses and britches for children in Africa. That's what God's people do when they thrive. When God's people thrive, they come together and see a world that is hurting now more than ever. And they, and they stop at nothing to make sure that children all across the globe have something to hope for and profess in and look forward to this Christmas season as they come together and open these Christmas boxes on Christmas morning this year all across the globe. Boxes that you have lovingly and prayerfully put together. And this is just a portion of what we're going to send out this year. This doesn't even scratch the surface of what's going to come, how this table is going to look a few weeks from now. This is what God's people do. We don't just survive. We don't just see an empty table. We see a table full of promise. We see a table full of possibility. We see a table full of canned goods and cinnamon toast crunch and graham crackers and peanut butter. And we say, you know what? Thank God for those things. Thank God for what you're doing in our midst. We see a table that calls each and every one of us to action as we give to our God so that others might know how to thrive and not just survive. We come to a table that I hope two weeks from now is just plastered with all of these orange cards all over the place that you're going to turn in. We hope to see a table that, that is covered with cards that, that you're going to submit very, very soon. That's going to be your promises, your commitments for what you're going to give in the new year. Your radical profession of faith saying that God's goodness is all around me and I want others to know that. This is what Christians see, church. This is what I want to see for the rest of the year and for the rest of my life. Because I don't want to just survive anymore. I don't want to just barely get by. I want to thrive, don't you? So church, be a part of this. Be a part of this. You can, you can take home uh, even more brown bags today. We've got some in the Welcome Center. You can, you, can make, you can pray over the boxes. They're going out this week, so, so it's almost the end of the line for those. But, but I bet Jan can, can collect some more over the next couple days. Right, Jan? If you have a box that you want to bring in and send across the globe, uh, get them here in the next couple days, and we will make sure they get to where they need to go. Fill out your orange cards. Tell us what you're thankful for. Help out. Pray with shared table. Do, do what you can do to, to let the world know that there are good things to be thankful for. Yes, 2020 is hard. And who knows what 2021 is going to bring us. It may be even harder. But God's people can walk into that land knowing that we are already new creations. God's people can walk into that new year with the faith that this is not an empty table. It never was and it never will be. Because God's good things, all good things, are all around us. Isn't that beautiful? Has the sun just started shining through right there? All good things. All good things come from God. May we be basked in his goodness as we bask in the sunlight now. And may we rejoice forevermore as we come to the table and discover a life of radical gratitude. Amen.